I think everybody's muted except myself. Yeah, you just wave your hand. Okay, so planning at APAL. And uh, Diane, you might recognize yourself there. <laughs> uh, so, oh, hang on. Jenny, you could go to the view yeah. button and, and get presentation view, then we don't see all the other clutter. Okay, now where's that hiding? Top left, maybe. Or maybe just the play button there. Yeah, oh, the play, that one. Sure. Okay, play, sure. Yeah, it's Stop. different. Is that better? Yep, yep good. There you go. Okay, so I've, I've still got you guys, but that's okay. Right, okay, so here we go. So what, what to consider when you're planning a day paddle? So first, I'm just gonna give an overview of what's coming with the slides. Uh, so we're gonna talk about group composition. So, so there's sort of the ethereal things and then there's the nuts and bolts like tides and currents. So the, the less nuts and bolts stuff is the group composition, how many people are going, their skill level, who will be making decisions. That's an important one if you're a group. The expectations of the group, currents, direction and strength. The tide height, this past winter, with the high, high tides and the, and the storms, is there a beach? Uh, route, uh, things to consider is uh, distance, explore different locations, you know, you don't want to go every time to Telegraph Cove or, you know, to beach your bay, you want to try some different things. And the wind, direction and strength, and I like to have a plan A and B, and occasionally if things are really not very clear a day or two before, I have, might even have a plan C. And then, of course, always thinking about safety. It's like plan a safe paddle and then have fun. So the group composition, oh, let me just say, if you've got a question, you can unmute and just speak out. Or if you prefer uh, the bottom of your screen, there's a chat button and you can write a note and Christine is going to monitor that. So in group composition, number of paddlers. Um, you know, our Wednesday group, which I was one of the original people back in the early 2000s, we started with six, eight people and it ended up being 26 to 30 kayakers. I left the group, it was way too big for me, right? And those are day paddles. Um, it's kind of nice with COVID that we've got small groups again, I think. Uh, individual skill levels. Um, something I ask people when I don't, know their skill is when did you last do a wet exit and a re-entry in cold water. Uh, individual comfort levels on the water. Um, some people, when I was learning, I was terrified of boat waves. I had to face the waves, you know, I was just like death grip on my paddle. Hey Jennifer, uh, um, I have a question. It's a strat yeah. strat here. I'm just wondering if someone, if you ask someone how long it was since they did a what exits and what's the time limit that would be too distant for you? 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I have, like when I was um, um, leading paddles for the club, I've stopped that for a while now, but um, you, you get somebody and they've done their basic course and they've only done a wet exit in the pool, mm -hmm. which I don't agree with personally, but it happens and they pass. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not overly happy taking them on a paddle. Have you ever declined someone? Yes. Okay. On, on a club paddle. Yeah. And we're talking more here about social. And so if you don't know the person, and it's a good question. It's a very good question because I, I'm pretty big on this. And I think Edgar is too on safety is uh, if somebody say, say Deb brought along a friend, as far as I'm concerned, she's responsible for that friend. I'm not responsible for it. In fact, I'm not responsible for anybody if I'm planning a paddle, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't, I check with Deb, has your friend, mm -hmm. you know, when, do you know her skill level? You know, I want to know that. I don't want to be surprised on the water, right? So, yeah. um, you know, I would love the club to, uh, and there is the, is it, um, what's the club in Victor um, Vancouver? Is it Pisces, Pisces, something like that. Anyway. Gabby, see Pisces. And they, Pika. They, they, their members have to do a wet exit in the ocean once a year. Once a year, okay. Okay, so long-winded reply, but it's a very good question. The other thing is, have you rescued anybody? You know, like, uh, <laughs> you know as, as we get older, it's not so easy, right? Everything, boats seem heavier and 
you know, where people move slower. Uh, so individual comfort levels on the water. You know, that peer pressure, you can be in a group and be partway through a paddle and, and uh, you come around the corner and suddenly it's choppier and you stop and you say, is everybody comfortable? Generally, nobody's going to say no in a peer group, right? So you, you have to be able to sort of read people or know the people. Um, you know, after a while, like with Norm's group, you get to know your buddies, your regular kayaking buddies, comfort levels and their skill level and, you know, how far they want to go and all that kind of stuff. So that comes... So, but if you don't know them and they don't, they're not being brought by somebody, you need to do homework, I think, by email or a phone call before they come. Uh, just, just to be really, you don't want to be surprised on the water. So comfort levels. Uh, yeah, so there we go. Going with friends or is there somebody new to you? Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, if somebody hosts and brings somebody, I make sure that person knows they're responsible for that person. Like, stay with them. Don't go off and disappear half a mile down the, you know, down the water. Especially and, if you're married to them. <laughs> yeah, that's, God, we've had that happen. I get so mad. The husband sort of disappears into the sunset and the wife's at the back of the pack. Um, another big one, uh, especially with we gray haired set, is anybody returning to kayaking after a break? You know, if they've had surgery or they've been sick or whatever, uh, what's their fitness level and their stamina like, right? So um, if they're gonna come with you, you wanna make sure they've got a good idea. You know, we're gonna be going 10 miles. Do you think you can do it, right? So I've got a buddy that hasn't done much paddling for a while and he used to be able to keep up with us all the time, but he's 83. The first couple of paddles we'll do shorter to make sure he's okay. Otherwise we'll get practice towing. Um, so Jenny, I just want to go back to the uh, re-entry. Mm -hmm. There's a real difference if somebody says to you they can do a, do a rescue. Uh, if they've done it on flat water, that's fine. But most people are going to capsize on rough water. Oh. So it's all about being able to do a rescue when you're in conditions that somebody would capsize in. So just something to bear in mind if somebody does say, oh, yeah, I can rescue someone. Yeah. Um, flat water rescues really don't count. On the other hand, um, once you got the swimmer's boat, everything's the same. It's just getting to the boat and, and once you've latched on, it, it's the same. You know, whether you're in a rip or whatever, it doesn't. And you know, if you're in Bain's Channel and it's blowing 15 with a strong ebb, you're not gonna be there anyway. I'm not gonna be there anyway, <laughs> but yeah. Um, I don't, think until level two, people are practicing rescues in rough water, generally. No, they're not. No. no. So uh, expectations of the group, it's interesting. Uh, you know, somebody says, kind of come on your paddle. You know, I make a point of saying, well, you know, we're doing eight mile, nautical mile paddles, or, you know, we're now doing 10. You know, the last couple we've done have been over 10. Uh, you know, do you think you're up to it? So there's paddling. I have found nothing, there's no, I'm a retired physiotherapist, there's no cross training that trains you for kayaking except kayaking. I mean, fitness helps to a degree, like cycling really helped my downhill snow skiing. There's good cross training with certain sports, but kayaking is nothing that really, you know, maybe rowing, maybe, you know, an erg, but, uh, and people's time commitment. You don't want somebody coming out and say, well, I have to be back by two o'clock, you know? So uh, thinking of commitment, you know, expectations for the paddle. Um, and, you know, our, my current group were called the Wednesday Wanderers, not Wanderers anyway. We wonder where we're going and we wonder at everything we see. It's wonderful, right? So we're not concerned about going three and a half, four knots paddling. Uh, we like to look at things, right? There's other groups and they're more A to B and destination orientated. So, but don't leave anybody behind. Make sure you've got a buddy system in place or if you are in the lead, check back where everybody is. And I'm not going to look at anybody in that our group that's here tonight. <laughs> so just one thing on the fitness, there are quite a number of Cisco paddles where people do get towed back. So uh, yep. don't underestimate paddle fitness. Yeah, so um, I, in that 
case, I would maybe suspect that the paddle leader didn't know that particular paddler Isn't that and yeah. uh, didn't do homework with contacting them to find out. Again, that's what expectations about how long the paddle is going to be or something might have happened. Um, so the style of paddling. Uh, are you going to noodle along the coastline, nooks and crannies, look at the flowers, look at the birds, or is it destination orientated? We're going to get here, you know, bang. Or are you going to throw and or are you going to throw in some skills practice? So uh, is it ex expectations of the group and, the, and um, if you're the planner, um, it's up to you whether you want input from the others or not. Um, it, it, that can evolve at, if you're if you started up a, a group. And then um, expectations, you like how much exposure are people happy with being exposed to on the water? You know, like um, somebody in our group used to be far more nervous than she is now. And now she's like, Phew. but you know, if you push people, if people are exposed too early and they get too scared, they're gonna give up kayaking. So that's not good either. So. The more you can know about this stuff, the better. Um, and this stuff, by the way, particularly expect it really applies to planning a trip where you're staying overnight and stuff, these expectations. So Edgar and I are both, you and the club, we're huge on safety first and then have fun. You know, so we're, you're going to be learning all the safe stuff and then you have fun. Um, Everybody knows to take the Transport Canada basic equipment, right? Um, very standard. Uh, one time we did have the Coast Guard come up and check us, <laughs> but it only happened once in 20 years. Uh, so we're there again, safety, when have you practiced? Our group, now that the air is getting warmer, this is a forewarning because a couple of people in the Wanderer group, we're gonna start doing some wet work, right? Make sure everything works that everybody can help everybody else. Okay, uh, a huge one with kayaks. And, and uh, um, for example, um, Christy knows about the, the Delta kayaks, the perimeter lines are your outside lines that run from the bow around and then to the stern and they're non, they should be non-elastic, right? And then your deck lines are the ones that go over the top and they're elastic and you can put stuff under them. And, and if your deck lines are too tight, and somebody's trying to rescue you, they've got nothing to hold on to except the hull of the boat, right? If they're too loose, it's like, you know, again, there's not much to hold on to. And uh, the, the deltas up until now, they have had elastic connections in their non-elastic perimeter lines. So you get this big doing, you know, when you try and hold, pull the boat up, you get like a foot, foot and a half of elevation before the boat starts to move. And Delta has been talked to and they haven't changed. So the owner of the boat has to change that, right? So that, that's a huge one for rescues. Uh, and uh, having them too tight is the problem the other way, right? So immersion gear, what does, what does immersion gear mean to you? Like you know, what you wear? Does somebody want to unmute and tell me what they take for immersion gear? Um, Rebecca and I have dry suits. So we, we prepare to be in the water for as long as we need to be. That's uh -huh. also because we practice rolling as well. Yep. And, yep. and when we do rescues, sometimes you're just in the water longer than you think you're gonna be, so. So do you wear anything under the dry suit? Oh yeah, we, we wear um, wicking layers against our skin and then the fleece and then the dry suit on top of that. So Jenny goes naked into her dry suit. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Edgar would pick up on it. <laughs> so see, so see, see, the dry suit doesn't give you, you know, like compared to the wet, doesn't really give you much more insulation. It's what you wear underneath. So if you're going out to practice rolling and you know you're going to fall out, or, and or you know wet exits and stuff. I, I personally put on more layers, right? But I wouldn't wear those layers to go on a 10, 12 mile paddle. I'd be too hot. So that's what I'm just asking. Um, yeah. And this time of year it's hard because it's minus 
degrees in the first thing in the morning with frost and then by lunchtime it's 12 degrees and what do you wear right it gets a bit hard but yeah dry suits does um, anybody else got anything else to add with immersion gear or is everybody dry suits i don't have a dry suit uh, i just have a wetsuit and i actually have taken to wearing long booties and short my shorty wetsuit and then uh, merino wool underneath your short, what's a shorty wetsuit? Well, uh, shorts, like a wetsuit short thing. Oh, so you've got bare legs. No, because my high top boots come on. So I've got bare knees. Oh, yeah. They're okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think a shorty is good because it, it protects the core, which is yeah. what you're really interested yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My kneecaps are hurting though. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and then I have a dry, uh, dry, dry jacket on top of that so yeah yeah i mean Jenny, I, wore, I wore a wet suit i think the first 10 years i kayak mm -hmm. yeah okay, jenny do you want to expand on uh the thermal regulation so if it's getting hot 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 what would you suggest people do uh i changed my my neck for chief like if i have something around there that keeps me too warm or, or change my take my wool hat off that's under my rain hat you know in the days when it's get war getting warmer yeah. and you know change out your mitts maybe at lunchtime yeah there's all that stuff so yeah. um yeah i've got little fleece gloves I, or that are my lunch bucket for at lunchtime so my hands are really cold and i have a dry pair of paddling gloves in my lunch bucket you know for winter paddling um but if you're too hot like on a it, you know it's not quite summer when you want to wear your wetsuit bits but you're still in your dry suit and you get hot you can hold on to somebody's bow and then lean over in the water, right? Get your, get your dry suit wet or your wetsuit wet. You can always do that. This past winter is the first time I've actually worn a buff under my dry suit, like around my neck. And then I've actually been able to pull it out on halfway through the paddle because I'm getting too hot. So it, like, it just lessens a little bit of the, <laughs> and as Deb says, taking I was wearing a wool toque underneath my wide brimmed hat and I could take the toque off and keep the hat on. So there's, you can sort of layer some bits that you can take off when you're actually on the water. But uh, I actually, seeing as you're on that subject, Deb, I actually had somebody in suit basin in summer have hyperthermia, mm -hmm. vomiting. We had to take her home. Yep, so we don't talk about hyperthermia, but it happens. Okay, so immersion. What does that mean to you? Um, so if you're on the, if you're, if you're, if you're planning the paddle and you're sort of like in charge but not leading, um, you can always just check. You know, like Diana Patton. Oh, there's been a few times when I said, you know, I'm stopping here because I'm going to have a drink. I'm going to hydrate, and then people say, oh yeah, I'm going to drink now because in winter we don't feel what we need to hydrate as much, but we really need to. So there's little things like that. So we're running out of time here because we I think we need to get to the planning part. Yes, we are. So VHRF radio, uh, you want to have at least one working radio in the group uh, for contacting if there's an emergency, if the weather's iffy and you want to check the weather at lunchtime. Um, some people do a call if they're crossing the ferry channel or going into a Squamalt Harbor, but you want to have one working radio usually for emergencies. Because um, cell phones don't work everywhere. They don't work out in souk very well. Uh, safety, route, distance. Are there pullout spots on your route, right? East Souk Park, there's long, longish distances where there's no, no beach to pull out, right? So you have to be aware of that. So the nuts and bolts, what to research and in which order. So we're gonna look at the various aspects of day trip planning. Um, so do you set a date like we do paddle on Wednesdays and you need to decide on a location or do you have a location in mind and want to find a date? So the groups you're going to break into, you've got a bit of both of this, the different groups. Uh, the order in which this is going to be presented, uh, it's not the order that's so important as the process and then over time you will develop your own technique. Um, and you do that with practice, 
mentoring and just doing it. Okay. It's really great if you've got somebody that can mentor you. Um, that's certainly what I had for years. Tides and currents, here we go. So what's the difference? You know, what are tides? What are currents? So does somebody want to unmute and tell me? I see Rebecca doing hand motions. <laughs> you want to unmute? Well, the one currents course we took with you, um, there was another person, Paul, mm -hmm. was on it. And you, when you asked that question, he had the simplest answer. It was just tides up and down, currents horizontal. <laughs> More or less, yeah, yeah. So do they happen in unison? Ha ha ha. No, they don't. No, they don't. You know, it seems to happen less often as I get older. Uh, very vaguely, but when the tide changes direction, the current doesn't change direction. No, not, not at the same time. But, and they can be really off. And I've had Anne Grace try to explain that to me, and I still get lost. So I just make sure I look things up. Uh, and then we're gonna look at why is it important to look at these things. So tides, where to look them up and how to interpret them. So as we said, they're no longer printing the tides and current booklet that, um, Edgar, do you wanna hold, I don't, can they see you? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Can, yeah. I, so I, can you I, hold I, up that old tides and current book? Cause I, I've thrown mine out. Just to show oh, this one. Yeah, so it's not, it's what they're not printing anymore. Yeah, so that book there, they're not printing it anymore, but you can get it online. And I just discovered yesterday that on the Cisco website, I wrote it down here somewhere. Uh, on the Cisco website, if you go to one of the far headings on the right of the screen, it says general interest, drop down menu to useful sites. It's got the direct link to tides and currents and the weather. So you don't have to remember or look it up from the scratch. You can just go to the website if you want to. So it's online now. And you've got links such as Big Wave Dave uh, and charts.gc.ca and then water levels. I, I tend to use as water level one. Um, I use Big Wave Dave for a lot of things and we'll go, go more into that. But just thinking of tides. Um, I, have a problem. I have a problem with tides and Big Wave Dave uh, and currents because you cannot select the date. When you go to it, it'll give you the tides for today and tomorrow. But if you want to plan a paddle for three days away from now, I don't know a way of putting in that date. You can't on Big Wave Dave. Oh, okay. You have, you have to look somewhere else. Yeah. So for tides, I would go to the, the, the water level. Okay, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll show you a picture in a minute of what it looks like, okay? Um, yeah, so Big Wave Dave is, is good for the two days. Like if you're doing a paddle tomorrow, you've got today and tomorrow that's on Big Wave Dave for, for that, for, for tides and currents. Uh, Big Wave Dave also has Environment Canada. And if you go to the extended forecast, you'll get if you went to the regular forecast or environment count on Big Wave Dave, you'd get today and tomorrow. If you clicked on the extended, you'd get tomorrow, the next day, and the next day. Yep. So there's quite a lot of information on Big Wave Dave without having to change websites. Okay. So uh, I'm not an app user. <laughs> I'm a hard coffee kind of person. Uh, some people love this I tides, AA tides, and it's got tides and currents. Willie really Fast swears by it. Um, does anybody else looked at it? And um, you actually pay for that one. Do you wanna unmute yourself, Nancy, and say something? Um, yeah, it's a really nice, it's a really fun website, the tides and currents. It, can, it gives you the graph if you want. Yeah, and uh, we w often walk along the walkway. We're close by West Song Walkway, and it's just fun to say, "Oh, oh, it's almost high tide. Oh, it's it's going on to low tide." <laughs> All right, okay. It's fun. 
And then uh, Edgar uses Navionics a bit. I do too. And Norm, okay. Yeah. And you use that for? I uh, mainly for route planning. Is it a free app? Yes, no, it's not, sorry. You pay for it once and then you have it for life. Oh, okay. It, it's actually really worth it. Um, because Navionics it means you've got all the charts right in front of you on your iPhone or on your iPad, and you can uh, measure distances, you've got ties, you've got currents, and um, you can plan routes using it. And I actually quite like, I don't take it with me in the kayak, but I, I do a lot of planning. If I'm at a coffee table talking to kayakers, I'll, I'll pull out the iPad and Pull up the pull up any chart in uh, in Canada, and you can sit and chat and look at the routes and where you're going. So, um, how, how much is it? I'm not sure anymore. Uh, no, mine was twenty five dollars. I don't know if they've increased the price. No, Norm, have you bought it recently? About twenty five dollars. Last time I bought it was about five years ago. Okay. Yeah, it might be twenty five for an iPhone and fifty for an iPad or something like that. But it also works on Android devices. It doesn't work just on Apple devices. Good. Okay, I went and clicked the next slide. So, uh, so when you go into the the water levels website, this is the kind of thing. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. So on this one, I thought I could point on this thing, but it looks like I can't. So up the top. You can see I've picked actually today's date and I picked Victoria. So you can change the date, you know, when you're, when you want to plan. And then um, this is what I take and I do a hard copy when I go on a, on a trip, not a day paddle, but on a trip. Uh, and I print off however many days the trip is for. So it's kind of good because you've got the high and the low and it's in meters or feet, depending how your brain works. Um, so you have that screen. And then this screen is the hourly. So there's midnight, 1 a.m. to right on through 10 in the morning when we're usually on the water somewhere in here. And there's uh, the dates down the left-hand side, the 6th of April. So there's today. So there, there you've got your high tide at 10, 11, 12. Oh, there's my cursor. And then uh, it's ebbing. And it's quite a good ebb because that's you know, below one meter. Okay. So, and this is on, this is the, the, the website for that, the water levels, which was on the previous slide, right? So, um, and um, not, it's something to be aware of. And it's certainly something to consider when you're planning a trip is looking at the moon. Because as you know, the, the moon has a big effect on the tides. And, and the thing with the, the uh, high, high tides is you might not have a beach to launch at, or you might not have a beach to land at either because you need to stop or for your lunch break. So it's, there's certain places in town and it's local knowledge where there's no beach at a high tide. You can't launch. <laughs> so, uh, so that kind of stuff, um, you know, like the local knowledge stuff, and it's on one of my slides coming up. Uh, well, Jenny, just mentioned that it's the the full moon and the new moon that are the the hot the big draws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, but you know, for a day paddle, you just look at the tides, right? I don't think okay. Do I, I I need to know what the moon's doing before I look at the tides? But if you're going on a trip trip, like we're away for a week or two, you can always pick a time when you don't have those high, high tides, so maybe not much beach for tents. So uh, local knowledge is, is you know, like if you're planting paddles around the area you're in, I mean, you cannot, and even on trips, if you can get local knowledge from the locals or from other paddlers, more experienced paddlers, it, it's invaluable. It's, it's not in the textbooks, right? So uh, things like the beaches, you know, uh, where can you launch and, um, effect of very, I'm big on that because I've been caught a few times. So Dave Ostapovich, who's our membership guy, he's got his own private website. And this, the link is on again, um, 
on the Cisco website and you go to that um, general interest useful sites, it's there, West Coast. It, it's down at the moment. It's broken. Is it still down? Anyway, he's done up a website, bless his heart, and it's got Lower Vancouver Island and it's got pretty well every possible kayak launch site. Some of them he's actually got high tide, low tide pictures. He's even got lunch locations. <laughs> uh, he's been very busy with Cisco stuff. So he's, uh, it's been down for a while, but that's well worth looking at when you're learning and, and, and latching on to somebody that's been paddling the area for quite a while. Like, like Vic Turkington, for example, right? Um, Is there any, does he have an idea when it might be back up and running? Nope. Right. Okay. No, I guess when Cisco coordinators and, and executives stop asking him to do things, <laughs> it's his personal website. You know, so uh, I mean, I've known Dave a long time. I don't, I don't want to bug him because I gather the club has really sucked his volunteer time up majorly with the website. There's been lots of issues. But, you know, just keep your eye on that and you can go in and check now and again and see if it's running. It's, it's really useful for... Um, running. Okay, so <laughs> currents, what to consider. So the direction of the current, is it with or against the tide? Why is that important? Somebody want to unmute and... Because if you're opposing the wind, you'll get more chop. That's right. Yeah. And you want to go with the flow if you yeah. can. And I think one of the groups, their question is, which is the best date to go? And it's a, a certain place, you know, which of the dates is better to go? And it's like, do you want to be fighting current or do you want to do a paddle where you're going with the current? I'll, I'll give you an example. Barry Copeland and I did a paddle from Island View Beach over to James across to Sydney Island, portage the spit. <laughs> uh, went off to Mont round to Mandarty, Halibut Island, and we caught the ebb and we were going six knots. Whew. And when we came around James Island, I knew the ebb went a certain way and then it, the ebb just took us all the way back to Island View Beach. Why wouldn't you? It's a long, it's a 16 mile paddle. I want all the help I can get. So we planned it on a day when the current was going to help us. So uh, currents, things to consider, the, the strength, that how, how big is the current going to be and the comfort and skill level of the group, right? Uh, my wanderer group, there are some places, most of the time, uh, I won't take them because we haven't practiced as a group in rough water enough yet, okay? So, um, and again, you don't want to scare people off and you don't want to have an incident where somebody gets really uncomfortable. So the effects of the wind uh, direction, and Deb's just said it. So uh, I have a photo coming up um, that um, will tell you why that's important. So the, as Deb said, if you've got wind with the current, it, it will be a little bit choppy, but if you've got wind against substantial current, you're gonna get the big, bigger waves, right? Um, so the effect on currents of a narrow passage. Now, a few of you have done my currents clinic, so you know the answer to that. So does somebody want to unmute and tell me what happens to current in a narrow passage? Speeds up. Yep, yep, it's like squeezing a hose, right? Uh, so you wanna think about that. Um, just trying to think. Um, anyway, uh, it, when you know there's a narrow passage, and, and those passages, you know, they're not tiny passages. You'll often see on a chart, there's the arrows, and uh, one arrow direction, will the arrow will have feathers on it, and the other direction arrow won't have feathers. And what I was taught is the arrow with feathers, feathers is flood, F and F. Feather, feathered arrow is flood. And if you see that and it says three knots, that's an average. You may have one knot at maximum and you may have five knots. It, it just, it's an average. But you know what, there's gonna be 
enough current that they've marked it on the chart. So this is 10 mile point. So this was the day that we actually canceled, Edgar canceled his current clinic. And this is looking back uh, at Oak Bay uh, at the yacht club there. So gyro is off to your right. So this is actually in the channel between the glass house and the nav aid at um, Cadbury Point, which everybody calls 10 mile point. So we had pretty good current. There's probably three knots of current and there was 15 plus knots of a westerly wind right in my face taking that picture. So you've got the ebb going into the picture and you've got the wind coming at you. And that's what happens. So that was a good choice to, good decision to cancel that current clinic. So does there, yeah, okay. So that's what the effect of wind on, on um, current can be. So uh, I really like this book. It's um, a book that's, um, everybody can see me. So it's a pretty hefty book. This is it here. It's about a foot tall and 10 inches across. And um, you can still buy that. Uh, you can also now get the app. What's, what's the app called? I've written it down. It's here. Don't panic. So uh, inside the book that I've just done a copy of a page with arrows and, and um, I, can, I can hold that up and, and that is just a copy. So the bigger the arrow, the bigger the current, right? So I keep losing my keep losing my where's my thing going anyway you can just see a reminder that even the fattest arrow is still only 2.5 knots so anything above that will you know won't show any more than the big fat arrow and it's an average mm -hmm. i'm trying to find my cursor i can't find it <laughs> kirsten how do i find my cursor I want to point something out. Do it verbally, Jenny. Move, move your mouse around, Jenny, in a circle and see if it comes up. Well, I am moving it around. Oh, okay. Um, not sure then. It's crazy. Anyway, so um, if you look at the, this picture, you've got Victoria, and then up top you've got Sydney. So that paddle that... Um, where is it? I'm sorry, folks. I'm just trying to find my cursor. Anyway, have you got, have you got a mouse, Jenny? Or are you I, yeah, I've got a mouse in my hand and I'm running it all over the place. I wonder if the battery's low on it. Try using your, have you got, use your keypad or your, um, your mouse pad. See if that'll work. Mouse pad. What's that? It's a square on. Oh, oh, you've got a desktop. Sorry. <laughs> right. Anyway, I was going to show them that just below Sydney, you've got James Island. And Sydney Island's the long, skinny one. And uh, Deb was saying the fattest arrows are 2.5 knots. Okay, we were going six knots. Right? So it's an average. Those arrows are an average, but the big arrows mean there's bigger current, right? So you know it can get up to six knots, even though it says 2.5 on the chart. It, sorry, it says, it says it, at the bottom of the chart with the big fat arrows, it says greater than 2.5. That's oh. the symbol. Ah, thank you. So it's, it's big, <laughs> but it's, it, that's as far as they're gonna go. Yeah. But it, it, it does have the indicator for it's greater than. So don't be deceived as you say. Yeah. Kirsten, if I unplugged my keyboard, it would be all right, wouldn't it? If I plugged it into my mouse? Yeah. Okay, I'm not gonna lose things. Okay, let's just so. I so. um, I'd like to have my cursor back. Now I've gone, now I've gone and hit something. So how do I go back? <laughs> I've not had this happen before, folks. So, uh, sorry about that. Can you roll the ball on the top of your mouse? Does that work? 
Um, so I can go forward. How do I go backwards? I've never gone backwards before. Back, back arrow? Try the back arrow or page. Where's the back arrow? Oh, here. You. Ah, there we go. Thank you. So all we're missing is my mouse. Anyway, so um, every page is different. And then uh, you used to be able to buy the booklets that had uh, these pages. So they're up the top left. You have March 2021. And then you can see I've drawn some lines, like if you look down the left hand side, like Wednesday the 3rd, uh, I've underlined 23, 24, 25, 26, 26. That's maximum ebb. Those are the big arrow day, uh, numbers. Up the top, the dark numbers, that's like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12. So you got the, the time across the top, the date down the side for March 2021. Again, the link for that is on the Cisco website. You can download the current Atlas tables every year. And I just print off the 10 months or the 12 months because I like paper copy because I look like looking ahead and to have an electronic thing where you got to keep scrolling through, uh, I like having it this way. So- um, And these are in standard time, right? Not daylight savings. Uh, no, these are adjusted. It's not like the tides and currents book. Okay. Okay. Good question. So, um, yeah. So the only issue is, unless somebody else knows where to find them, I, I kept one of the old original, um, books that we used to be able to buy. In fact, I think you can still buy them. I think they're now called uh, Wagner. So I didn't take a picture of this, but there's this, where am I here? Of course it's upside down, isn't it? It's Wagner tables. And then inside the tables at the top corner, it's got the scale, um, the large numbers, the numbers for large flood are one to eight. So, uh, but the large flood are these ones, 23, 24, 25. Anyway, we won't spend a lot of time on that, but- um, Are you looking for Murray's tables? Yeah, uh, are they still called Murray's tables or the Wagner tables? No, Murray's, these are Murray's tables and that's this year. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I just print them off, yeah. So I'm, I'm not buying the book anymore, I'm just printing off. Okay, so weather, what- And Boersboom are on the website. Pardon? The Boersboom ones are on the website, aren't they? The what ones? Boersboom. They're uh, on the, they're a link. Oh, on okay. the uh, are they all, is it all the same thing? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so with weather, what to consider? Our main concern as kayakers, is with wind and fog. So my question is how far ahead, if you're planning a paddle for next week, can, can you make a decision on wind and fog? Two or three no. days. No, what? Two or three days maximum. Thank you, Norm. You're in my camp. Uh, so we want to consider the wind strength and direction, right? Um, the effect on land mass and large bays on the wind. So um, 10 mile point is a, a good example. If there's a westerly, you can paddle on the north side or this whatever side it's called, the, the non-Cabra Bay side of 10 mile point at Telegraph Cove, anywhere along that shoreline and be fairly protected from westerly wind even southwesterly wind. Um, so land mass is huge for making decisions locally. Um, the thing to watch, for example, with Telegraph Cove and paddling towards Sydney is there are some low land points like at Queen Alexander Hospital and the wind will come over the top and come down. So you will get some wind through 
the low land areas there uh, coming over the top. But land, land is just incredible. You, you can be out in choppy seas, crossing over to Discovery, Chatham Island, and you go around the corner and you get protected by land and it's glassy calm. So of course you can get a little bit um, complacent if you then stop for lunch where you can't see what's happening with the wind, right? That has happened <laughs> with a group of experienced paddlers and they end up being rescued. Somebody got rescued by the sea rescue people because somebody capsized. Um, winds funneling through gaps. Um, where wouldn't it be an example here, Edgar or Deb or Norma? Is there anywhere where we get gap? Uh, well, Squally? How about Squally? Uh, Squally reaches. Squally reach is a good one, right? So uh, westerly winds can come down you know, off the Malahat from up the Goldstream end. And uh, you can go, I've been there like last year, glassy calm, beautiful day. And in 20 minutes, there's white cats, right? I'd say Sansom Narrows is a classic place where the wind funnels through. Oh yeah, certainly the current funnels through there. <laughs> uh, I'll just tell you, I had an experience in um, Desolation Sound and I was, that was my first kayak trip with a friend and my sister. <laughs> and uh, we are paddling um, west, like inland or east, inland. And it sounded like a waterfall. It sounded like a waterfall. And then we could see ahead, there was like a patch running from the shoreline out uh, into the main channel uh, of whitecaps. And the wind was whistling down through the valley. So we got across and when we came back, it was still there. It was, it was like a, an, an outflow. Um, we tend not to get that, but Squally Reach is well named. That's a good one. Uh, it's not that often we get surprised by wind if you've looked ahead at the forecast. It's been my call. The, the two times in 20 years where I've been surprised that I can think of, it was a squall. It wasn't, it wasn't a steady wind and it came up out of nowhere and it was gone like in half an hour. And uh, it's two times in 20 years where I've been surprised. Uh, fog invisibility is a safety issue, especially if you're crossing a busy boat channel. One of the great things with COVID, there hasn't been nearly the motorboat traffic, but uh, we've got a lot of um, boat channels like crossing to Chatham Discovery, the whale watching boats, um, crossing the ferry crossings um, over to Portland or you know, Piers Island, uh, even being careful of the Washington State Ferry when it runs, when does it run? And then they've got the Fulford Harbor Ferry, you know, the Salt Spring Island Ferry. So we've got lots of that to consider with crossings if you've got poor visibility. Um, a good exercise to do with your group if you do have fog uh, my old friend Duncan did this. He deliberately had us launch. He had us face shore and paddle backwards until we couldn't see to experience what it felt like to paddle in thick fog where you cannot see. And that really sorted us out with whether we would go or not. So uh, it's a huge safety one. Uh, so strength. So how far a bit ahead is reasonable for predicting wind and norm said it as far as i'm concerned three days out you can look ahead and be somewhat sure two days out you're more sure and then even then they can get it wrong um, some people plan a trip days before that and i don't quite understand they're experienced paddlers and they seem to get away with it but there you go um, so again, where to look, big wave day, we've talked about that. It's only for two days out. I got Environment Canada. Big wave, Dave also has a wind model that's just two days out. Um, predict wind is a great, you know, I love charts and seeing colors and arrows and stuff. So predict wind is great. Um, you pay for that one. 
sail no. flow is free. Sailors use that. Again, I really like that one because again, it's mm -hmm. got pictures and you can scan through the hours. I really like that. And there's you wind. can predict wind is, is free if you only want the eight kilometers out. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, thanks, Deb. And then you've got windy and um, you experience people. Do you use anything more than that? I guess nope. you've, got, you've got eye tides, there's tides and currents, isn't it? And um, Navionics, does that give you wind, Edgar? No. no. Just charts and stuff? Okay, right. Uh, these are the ones I look at. So I look at one, two, three, four, five. I don't look at this one. I look at five wind forecasts. If they're all saying the same thing, same direction, more or less the same speed, I'm pretty confident two days out that that's going to be what happens. If it's all over the place, I will wait until Tuesday afternoon to decide on Wednesday's paddle. You know, I mean, I, I like being really safe. So there we go. Um, Jenny, just do a spell check on Big Wave Dave. Oh, look at that. Yeah, you're right. Predictions and accuracy. So approximately three days out max. You can look further out to get a general idea of storms and things. I, I just don't waste my time. Uh, so looking for the year is likely to change, right? Um, it, you get a very general idea if you're looking further out. And the huge one is Environment Canada is generally predicts higher. If, if you see Environment Canada saying light for Harrow Strait, take it because it's, <laughs> they don't say light very often because their predictions are for offshore for shipping, right? And we don't paddle out there. So just be aware that look at Environment Canada, but it's generally going to be higher, generally. Uh, where to look for it. And I couldn't break that down because I indented these. So again, you got Big Wave Dave, Environment Canada, but Environment Canada is also on Big Wave Dave, Sailflow Windy Predictions. And then uh, Mike Jackson really likes the School Weather Station one. And again, this one is listed all pretty well. Yeah, this one is, uh, this one and this one and this one are all listed on the Cisco website, as I told you. So, um, um, you just got to pick the ones that you like and then have them as favorites so you can go straight to them, right? So in summary, currents and tides, we can consult for any time in the future, right? You can look for December, 2021, right? <laughs> That's there, That's not gonna change. Winds can seriously be considered from three days ahead, right? Uh, where you look and what sequence you use is a personal choice. I tried to get out of my experience kayaking buddies what they looked at first and it was like, um, it was difficult. And then plan to stay safe and have fun. And that's it. So I do, I do apologize for my lost cursor. It seems to be permanently gone. I'm not usually so disorganized. Uh, so do people have any questions before we have our Break. You can unmute. Yeah, I just had a question because I didn't um, ever learn about the tides and currents, how they interact when you said they don't go together. And yeah, I can see that. Um, is it kind of just the same as wind and current? Um, wind Where they can no, cause bigger wind. waves because if they're contrary. Oh, the. Good question. So, you know, the tides go up and down and the currents go this way. Uh, ebbs are bigger than floods. Um, somebody told me, but I've never, I haven't had it verified. It has to do with big rivers like the Fraser, you know, with the outflow happening. I, I, I don't know, but Edgar can agree or not, but ebbs are bigger and yeah, when you get the big ebbs like it in Baines or around race rocks, they, they're like, you know, six, seven knots. Mm -hmm. And if there's a pinch point, it's more. 
right? Mm -hmm. So when the tide finishes coming in, you're going to high tide, you still have the flood happening. The tide starts going up, but the tide does not affect the, the current as far as what happens on the water. Does that sort of answer that? Okay. But they don't happen, they're not synchronous. Like the tide right. is coming in, yeah, it it is, it flood stops, and then it goes the other way. There's a, there's a lag. And sometimes the lag, I don't understand it. It's, it's like a couple of hours difference. So you, you really have to look at both. Uh, but the, the tide going in and out, like up and down, does not, if the tide's going out and the flood is still happening, it, that does not cause an interaction. Is that what you're asking? Okay. So uh, can I jump in here, um, Jenny? Both feet. Both feet. So if, if everything was equal and you just had a, a uniform um, kind of bathtub with a uniform bottom and you're pushing water in, uh, when you had a high tide, you would have no current. And when you had low tide, you would have no current. You'd have slack water. But the, the problem is that when you've got all these islands and you've got um, a topography on the bottom of the ocean that is not smooth. And what you have to think of is the pressure of the water is being pushed up through the Juan de Fuca Strait, and it's being pushed into the Gulf Islands from, from the south. And you, if you think of it as a big bathtub and the pressure of the water coming up, it's gonna squirt through all the little channels and between the islands and up the straits, and it will take whichever way it, whichever route it can. And um, so that affects the, the high tide not, not being uh, consistent with slack water. So for example, I, I do a lot of sailing around Sydney and Dock Island. And we know that um, if we go to the tide tables and look at low tide, then the ebb runs for up to an hour after low tide. So, so kind of what's happened is the pressures pushed all the water up through the islands, through, through Sanson Narrows, um, by Gabriola and Pender, and then it's still trying to flow out. And right at the end of what you think is low tide, there's still water up there that's moving and coming out. So in this particular situation of Sydney, you can expect an ebb to run for an hour after the the low tide time in the tables. Now that's just local knowledge from sailors who've sailed around here for the last 30 years. Um, but in different places and elsewhere, it, it could be different. So when Jenny says, find out for some local knowledge, that is something that you might, uh, you might learn from somebody who's paddled or sailed in the area for, for quite a long time. So currents for me is the big one. When I'm planning a paddle, uh, First thing I'm doing is looking at the chart. I'm looking for the current arrows. I'm also looking to see if there's any current stations. And if you've got your charts in front of you, between Sydney Island and James Island, there's a, um, a diamond shape with an A. So that says there's a current station there that you would find in your tide and current books. It's actually a secondary station. So it'll be based on, uh, based on race rocks probably. And there's current arrows next to it. So if, if you see current arrows on the chart, you know you can expect at maximum flow to maximum ebb, um, currents in there up to three knots. So generally, if you're with a beginner group, you don't want to be there when, um, when you've got max flow to max ebb. So uh, that's, uh, that's why I think currents kind of are the most important. Um, Jenny said she was paddling at six knots down the side of Sydney Island. Sorry, six knots over ground. Well, if she's paddling at three knots and the current's going in the same direction with a three knot current, she's now moving at six knots. But if you are paddling against that three knot current and you are paddling at three knots, you're not going anywhere, you're doing zero. You're standing, you're standing exactly where you are. So that's why around here currents are I think the most important uh, aspect to consider. That, that's why I really like the current atlas. I mean, it's not exact, but you get a really good idea 
And there's areas when you look at, because each page in the current atlas is, is the same, it's the same map and it goes all the way out past um, Whiff and Spit and all the way up to Gabriel Island, the, the, the one page, okay? And the whole book is just full of pages. And each page has got the hourly currents that happen in this whole South Island. And I, I just love it because you get a real visual, but there's also spots where you can see where there's like a toilet bowl effect with the current. And it's kind of fun, you know, if you're into that kind of stuff to go there at that hour and see what happens, you know? Uh, so again, it's not absolutely precise, but it gives you a very good idea. So did so that- the, the other thing is if you're around Tofino, there aren't any um, current stations there, uh, but there are big currents. You can get up to three to five knot currents between some of those islands. So to estimate the currents, the only thing you've got to really use the high and low tides because there are tide tables, uh, tide stations there. So you kind of have to almost assume that the maximum current or the maximum ebb is between high tide and low tide, and then give yourself maybe plus or minus an hour or so because you really don't know when that max current is there. But for Tofino, you don't have any current information, so you have to go with the tide information. But so. I do. I put little post-its for the, you know, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2 on the different pages. Just because I can't remember. 10, 11, 12, what do you mean? For the times, you know, I sort of, I've decided this is, you know, I put this for the page numbers, I just put the times and then I can go, what's it going to be like at, you know, 10 o'clock, it's going to be here. And 11 o'clock, this one. Because sometimes they're not in order, they do. You know, 